The game every player wants to win the most is usually the very last. A series. A dance. A bowl. However, in stock car racing, it's a little different. It's the first. It's where the very first NASCAR race was ever run, on the sand. It's also where the sport lost one of its biggest stars. But among all those memories lies the grandeur, the spectacle that signals the beginning of each new season, where dreams can be realized, where legends can be made. On NASCAR's biggest stage, the Daytona 500. We are inching ever so closer to the 66th running of the Daytona 500, NASCAR's biggest race. Welcome to Countdown to Daytona. I'm Kevin Conley. And I'm Danny Harden. Join us for a ride over the next hour as we hear from the drivers, get into the big stories coming up for 2024, and get you ready for this weekend's Daytona 500. I'll tell you what, Danny, there was a huge story the other night in qualifying as the Fords had a big night and ended the stranglehold of Hendrick Motorsports on yeah, the pole. Yeah, Hendrick had won the pole for the Daytona 500 for nine straight years. That is an incredible streak, but you know what? But that incredible streak is over. Michael McDowell was pretty fast, and it looked as if he would grab the top starting spot until Joey Logano, who was the last car out in the second round of qualifying, hit the track. Logano wins his first career pole for the Daytona 500 with a hot lap of 181.9 miles an hour. There really isn't a better victory lane to be in than the one we're standing in right now uh, in the sport. So it's uh, always special to anytime you see your car in here and your, your guys celebrating, uh, whether it's for a, a pole or uh, a duel or the 500 or the, you know, the, the fall race or tricycle race. I'm pretty sure anytime you're in here, it's pretty damn cool. Daytona has a unique qualifying format after the front row is set they go to the qualifying races on that thursday and those qualifying races danny usually give us the best indication on which drivers to really look for in sunday's race one of the biggest stories in the duels the fact that seven-time cup champion jimmy johnson had to drive his way into sunday's 500 all he had to do was to beat jj yaley in duel number one however on the final lap it did not look good for Jimmy. I'm like, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make the Daytona 500. I'm going to have to call our, all of our partners. I'm going to have to stand in the suite and shake hands during the 500 and not drive a car. Like, this is running through my mind as I'm catching them. I'm like, I've got to figure out a way. Jimmy Johnson got a break past Yaley, and yes, he will be in the 500. The winner of that first duel, Tyler Reddick, who edged out Chase Elliott at the end, that started a super night for Toyota. You know, I think when we look at, you know, how the car performed when it came down to crunch time, that certainly for me is, is something that it's going to be nice knowing going into the race, you know. Coming to the checker, Dragon. Winner of duel number two, Christopher Bell to complete the Toyota sweep. Bell is thrilled to get a win on a super speedway. I feel like I've done a lot of things wrong at this racetrack, so it's been so nice to be able to get a couple good runs with, uh, you know, the Daytona 500 last year, and then obviously winning tonight was, it, it was just a really big confidence booster. There are three car makers in the NASCAR Cup Series, Chevy, Ford, and Toyota. For Ford and Toyota, they made big-time changes to the body in the offseason, and they're hoping that will help and translate to success on the track. We will see if that is the case or not. This season, Toyota changed the nose of the car and also a little to the rear deck lid as well. Ford, on the other hand, made more dramatic changes with the introduction of the Dark Horse Mustang all along its racing platforms. You know, this was a huge test for the new Camry. Yesterday was about as bad as it gets, and then today was about as good as it gets, winning both of the races between me and Tyler. So um, I think that that goes to show that we're in a really good spot for Sunday. I think that's the scary thing for the competition is we still won the championship last year as a manufacturer on what I think the whole manufacturer would consider a, a very down year from a performance standpoint. Um, so this one should be way better. We should be more competitive week in and week out. Ryan Blaney has worn the title of the next great driver since he started winning races at the age of 19 on just a limited schedule in the Xfinity series almost a decade ago. Now Blaney put it all together last season and won the championship for the first time in his career. The trick now, doing it again. RB right, Blaney! In 
in sports, potential doesn't always equal production. You could say Ryan Blaney finally realized his full potential last season, winning three times in the first championship of his career. 2023 will be an unforgettable year on so many different levels for him. Yeah, from the championship, getting engaged, and I turned 30 uh, late December, so I keep telling people, like, I don't know how we top the end of 2023. Like, it was a huge year, and um, so, yeah, just really great, really great to, to share you know, those few moments with, with her. Blaney spent a lot of his time this offseason making different appearances representing NASCAR. I've kind of always been that way, um, of opening myself up for opportunities to grow the sport. Because it doesn't only grow the sport, it grows yourself as well. And it's, to me, in my mind, it's a win-win for everybody, right? Because I want the sport to be healthy because I want to be in the sport for a long time. Racing is the family business from his grandfather to his father, Dave, who spent 17 years in the Cup Series. So Ryan learned NASCAR from the inside, which is why he rarely said no to appearances. That's what my dad told me at a young age is, you know, trying to leave something better than when you found it or when you got into it. And that's how I've approached everything. So now his attention turns to what's next. Like, okay, that's a great accomplishment. All right, where do we go from here? All right, how do we continue this success or how do we continue to up our game, obviously? So uh, I was saying the last two weeks of the season were, were odd because, you know, we win Martinsville. We didn't even have time to celebrate Martinsville as a team because you're immediate to Phoenix. Win Phoenix, and we were able to celebrate it a little bit, um, but it just, it gets scrunched together. So. Uh, you know, I think it's time to celebrate and we've had our time to celebrate, but now it's okay. How do we replicate it? Blaney starts the season as one of the favorites to win the Daytona 500 and one of a handful of drivers with the best odds at bagging the championship. All right, there are many who believe for NASCAR to really grow, it has to go international. Danny, will we see a race go overseas? And what about more foreign-born drivers? Yeah, how about Shane Van Gisbergen? He has moved to the United States, and he is ready to get his NASCAR career on a roll. He's the new kid on the block. Shane Van Gisbergen has moved to America after a phenomenal career racing in Australia. Last July, his life changed forever when he became the first NASCAR driver in 60 years to win a cup race in his debut, putting on a show in Chicago in NASCAR's first street race. What did that Chicago win do for you? I guess just opened my eyes to, to other things. You're so, I was so entrenched in my world down there and just supercars only and getting to see what, what other series are like and what it can be over here. And yes, anything, you can make yourself anything here and I want to come and do my best. I've always watched it on TV and always been a fan of it, but yeah, I never thought I'd come and do it. So getting that result at Chicago, I just thought, you know, now I've got to go have a crack and try and get in the Cup Series full time. Van Gisbergen will drive for Colic Racing this season, full time in the Xfinity Series and seven Cup races, looking to be full time in Cup in 2025. The 34 year old who is originally from Auckland, New Zealand, will have a crazy Saturday here in Daytona, competing in the ARCA and Xfinity races back to back. Shane knows he needs to learn how to run the ovals and how to fit in with the other drivers. Yeah, I'm sure the time will come when we get into a spin out with someone or a disagreement, but um, yeah, I just, I guess you just gotta give respect to get it back and I'll try and settle in and find my place. The other day, Kevin, Shane told me that he recently visited Lexington Barbecue, so he's getting used to this North Carolina kind of style of life. We, we know that he's a great road course racer. We'll see if he can get it done on the ovals. Yeah, and that ARCA race has been moved up to tonight at 1030. Folks, we have reached our first pit stop here on Countdown to Daytona. Still to come, we're going to hear from Ryan Priest. He was the NASCAR driver who was involved in a terrible accident last year here at Daytona, but that has not deterred him one bit. He's back and more determined than ever. And every year there's a new crop of rookies that make their way into the NASCAR Cup Series. This year, the class of 2024 features three drivers, Josh Berry, Carson Hosevar, and Zane Smith. Three very different personalities, all with the same goal of winning races.
Last August, Martin Truex Jr. announcing that he would come back and race in 2024 instead of go off to retirement. When he was asked why he made this decision, Martin Truex Jr. said, quote, because I wanted to. That's all he said. So the hunting and fishing every day for Martin Truex Jr. will have to wait. Now it's time to go racing. Martin Truex Jr. has experienced the thrill of victory. 34 times in the Cup Series and the ultimate, the 2017 championship. But MTJ has also experienced his share of rip your heart out disappointment, like losing the 2016 Daytona 500 by just inches to Denny Hamlin. I just got to think of, you know, guys like Earnhardt that it took, you know, he won everything here and it took him 20 years to win this race. And uh, it's just a tough race to win. Truex, 19 starts in the Daytona 500 just two top tens. But maybe this will be the year for this driver who has thought about retirement the past two years, but just couldn't. You know, 22 was a tough season for us and it was difficult, more difficult to make the decision to come back for last year. And, um, you know, after his, the way last year was going, middle of the season, I'm like, yeah, why would I not keep doing this? You know, so i um, been having fun and hopefully we can have more fun this year. But at age 43, the oldest full-time cup driver in the garage, Truex is looking forward to life after racing, whenever that comes. I mean, I have a lot of hobbies away from the track, and that's kind of what helps keep me going at this stage of the game because, you know, it's a grind. You know, I'm going on going on 20 years um, of doing this full time, and, um, you know, that's, that's a lot. So uh, do a lot of fun stuff away from the track, hunting, fishing, a lot of hobbies, and uh, that keeps me going, keeps me uh, recharged each week to go grind it out. While Martin Truex is thinking about the end of his career and retirement, Jimmy Johnson, who retired once, is back for more on a limited schedule. Yeah, he, Jimmy becomes the first Hall of Famer to get back into a cup car. Jimmy Johnson, the GOAT, the seven-time cup champion, he had a little drama last night in his qualifying race, but he is in the show, which we talked about earlier. There's no denying that Johnson is one of the all-time greats. 83 cup victories, seven championships, including five in a row. Even with all that success, he was humbled by his Hall of Fame selection. Our sport is uh, is very special and allows a long runway for, for drivers. And it's a moonlight as I'm going to and run nine races next year is really neat and fun and a great opportunity. But um, it's wild to think. I mean, if, I swear it feels like I was just, just 25 a couple of days ago when this whole journey started in the 19 full-time years in Cup. Uh, to be standing here now with the success we had just blows my mind. Some big changes at Legacy Motor Club heading into this year. John Hunter Nemechek has been hired to drive the number 42 car this season as a teammate to hold over Eric Jones. Johnson running a part-time schedule in 2024. There is also the switch to Toyota, which comes with additional factory support. All positive moves for this team. You know, it's it's been a lot of, lot of leg work and getting getting prepared, you know, on, on the team side of things and just kind of learning the car, learning simulation and everything that comes with making a manufacturer switch. But uh, overall, I think the support is way higher than what we had, obviously. So that's a good thing. 200 laps makes up the Daytona 500 and many times the difference between winning and losing is the decision and the moves being made on the final turn of the final lap here at the Daytona International Speedway. Drivers can plot and plan for weeks. Teams can have multiple strategy meetings, looking at all the different scenarios, but it does come down to the man in the seat with his hands on the wheel. This week, we asked most of the drivers just what position they wanted to be in on that final turn. As you would expect, we got different answers. Everybody has a different philosophy on that. And um, I'm, I don't think that just one one answer works. I think you got to know who you're around, your strength, your weaknesses, uh, where where your teammates are at, where the help's going to come from. I think second or third place is probably the the spot you want to be in, and, and you want to have a teammate or a, a friend behind you. I, I think the leader of the race is is in such a vulnerable spot. Well, the only reason why you have friends is because it's a it's a mutual benefit right but eventually when it's your benefit you have to do whatever you have to do to 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 benefit to benefit yourself 
but we're going to try to find a way around in one way or the other, right? It's a, there's a lot going on in those moments for sure. 56 of his 63 career wins came in a Toyota. But Kyle Busch, boy, he has found a new home at Richard Childress Racing, driving the number eight Chevy. Yeah, Kyle had three wins with RCR last year in his first year with that organization. Big expectations again this year for a guy who has more total wins in NASCAR than any other driver. Winning never gets old for Kyle Busch. 63 wins in the Cup Series, 102 more in Xfinity, 64 in the trucks. Add it all up, 229 NASCAR victories, by far the most in the history of the sport. Is it something to be proud of? I guess, you know, years ago, like, they was, they, you were clicking them off so fast that I couldn't keep track. I didn't know what number I was on, you know, but lately it's kind of slowed down a little bit. So I, I don't like that fact of it, but... Um, you know, still having as many as I've had just means the success that I've had. It's been amazing. His career has been amazing so far. He'll be in the NASCAR Hall of Fame one day, a Cup Series champion in 2015 and 2019. Kyle has won just about all the marquee events. Coke 600, Brickyard, Talladega, With Kyle Busch, the winner, Kyle Busch. Darlington, Challenger 500, Kyle Busch. Bristol, Kyle wins the all-star race the all-star race 12 years of the only thing missing a win at the daytona 500 kyle still has his a game and retirement seems like it's far down the road yeah we're probably starting the fourth quarter so i'm not tired yet but um i'm like lebron you know if i gotta go into overtime let's do it after 15 years at joe gibbs racing bush moved over to richard childress racing last season i'm looking forward to some more success i mean we won three races last year we had a great start to the season we kind of got a little cold in the second half so we definitely want to find that and make sure that we can stay good all year long so we can be in the playoffs a lot longer and make it to the final four if he keeps winning here in 2024 the spotlight will continue to shine on Kyle Busch. Well, NASCAR fans are some of the most loyal in all of sports. They love to hear about their favorite drivers and get the inside scoop. Still to come, the explosion of NASCAR podcasts. It's become a very popular way for fans to get connected to NASCAR and do it on their own time. <laughs> but up next, he was involved in a terrible accident last season at Daytona this season. Ryan Priest returns with more determination than ever to, con the to conquer the world center of racing.
Almost all of the drivers in NASCAR are linked to a charity or even have their own foundation. Yeah, Daniel Hemrick came up with an idea about awarding a college scholarship to a student near his hometown. It's been a win-win for everybody. Myra White loves it when the sparks are flying. Either at her welding class at Roan Cabarrus Community College or the big one. Logano's caught up in it. on a NASCAR track. So it was a big deal when Myra not only received the Daniel Hemrick Be the Change scholarship two years in a row, but got to meet him at the college. Good to see you. I've been many times over and Zoom and yeah, it Zoom final, finally in person. Love the sweatshirt. Hey. Raising on a farm, like money's got to go into the farm. And me getting the scholarship allowed me to give back to my parents. Instead of them worrying about making sure my tuition's paid for, I had the scholarship from Daniel to allow me to continue my education and become where I am now. And where she is now, not only a student, but also teaching a welding class. They give us great deals whenever we need yep. more machines. And Hemrick, who was raised in nearby Kannapolis, wanted to give back to the community to say thanks for all the help he got during his time moving up in racing. I never had a plan B, but also somewhere in the back of my mind in the kind of the days where it didn't look like it was going to work out, I'm like, man, what am I going to do here? I'm going to have to go learn a trade. I'm going to have to go figure something out. And I knew that Rowan Careers Community College was an option if I had to go do that. Hemrick started this scholarship back in 2019, now giving out two scholarships a year. I knew when we started the scholarship, you know, it was my first full-time year of cup racing. Didn't know if it was going to be my only one or if it was going to go on forever, but I knew at that particular moment I had, to, I had the time right now to make that investment to, um, to do something like that in our community, to, to be that change. In the past few years, Hemrick has been busy, won an Xfinity championship, got married, now with two kids, back in the Cup Series full-time in the 31 car with Colleague Racing. His scholarship is given to a student in the field of mechanical engineering, welding, or motorsports. Anytime a race is on, I'm watching it. I grew up watching racing. I grew up watching Jeff Gordon and all those NASCAR drivers. But now she has a new favorite driver, Daniel Hemrick. Change your pattern up there at the end. You yeah. went the dragon instead of circles. It's, I kind of like doing the circles. That yeah. way, if you get any undercut or anything, yep. it kind of helps fill in that gap. Not bad, not bad. That's right. Claire Goodwin joins us again. And Claire has got that story on a team that is hoping to make some noise this season. Hey, yes, all you can do is hope, but it's better when that hope pays off, right? If there's anything that NASCAR has promoted within the past few years, it is growth. That means that they've had a new car, some new cities, even a new team. Spire Motorsports, the freshest face in the Cup Series, but entering this season with three cars, the team is ready to cement a name for itself. There has been more change this offseason than I think there's been in the entirety of, of the time I've been here for the last three years. In Mooresville, North Carolina, it was home to one of the most decorated drivers in the sport. But now instead of Kyle Busch Motorsports, the building boasts the name Spire Motorsports. I remember coming here as a kid and uh, seeing Kyle's team and Kyle's suits and everything. So it's, it's really cool that um, you know my first year in the Cup Series on Sunday, uh, you know, I get to come into this building that I came as a kid. In less than 90 days, Spire has transformed the facility into its home base. Getting situated between three cup cars and four truck teams, uh, piling into one, one building under one roof has been a, a tall task. You know, a lot of different personalities with different ideas and trying to make everybody happy and the workflow work for everybody. It's a huge step up from the previous shop where the team began its journey as full-time NASCAR contenders. They wanted to be, grow to be a multi-car organization and also a race winning organization. So uh, to that actually become coming to fruition and like see it come from the start and as it grows and as it develops and evolves it is, is pretty cool. And I take some pride in that to, to be a part of one of the original groups that have kind of get this thing going and keeps it going. It's kind of got me used to take on any challenge, uh, kind of starting from the ground up, which is which has been fun. It's it's been a process, a growing process. Literally, my first day uh, at Spire several years ago, we were painting walls. But with great risk comes great reward. Spire may still be the new kids on the block, but taking over the facility of an all-time great 
may be foretelling of what's to come. It's the biggest thing I see is all the empty trophy cases. Kyle had a lot of trophies uh, and we have just pitchers stuck in there right now, but we're going to work hard to, to put a couple trophies in here. We have three very capable teams and drivers. And so working together and learning quickly is going to be hopefully our advantage. And so if we can do that, I think pretty soon we're going to see that we'll find ourselves where we want to be, which is in victory lane which will then hopefully start a new legacy in this building of filling trophies uh, like Kyle did. One veteran, two rookies, and a goal to compete with the best of the best. The building is the first step. I also like to say stack pennies, right? You get the pennies and you do all the small things, right? It adds up into something big, and, and we're going to stack a lot of pennies this year. Well, some of the biggest names in the sport have been named the Rookie of the Year. This year, three drivers are fighting for that title. All three are in very good cars, and any of them could be the kings of the rookie class in 2024. Three rookies racing for Cup Series Rookie of the Year. Three very well established racers at every level so far. Three stars in the making with very solid resumes. At the racetrack, Carson Hosevar is famous for wearing those interesting looking hats. Tried every sport under the book that was a lot cheaper. Uh, wasn't good at any of them, very uncoordinated. Zane Smith may be a rookie in the Cup Series, but after winning the Truck Series Championship in 2022, he knows what it feels like to be on top. For me, I just want to have a steady progression throughout the year and, and obviously hopefully win the Rookie of the Year. Josh Berry's road to the NASCAR Cup Series was hardly a direct route. Like I kind of felt like that I was going to be a career short track racer, right? And, and I had made peace with that, I think, in a way. Last year at the age of 20, Josevar was also wearing many different hats, being a full-time truck series driver, where he ended up in victory lane four times, and also filling in in the Cup Series, running eight of nine races with Legacy Motorsports. So this is about perfect for me, and uh, I just enjoy every second of it. Come year end, I, I want to still be progressing and, and having my arrow upwards instead of downwards. For Smith, progression comes with learning, adjusting, and executing. I felt like my time in NASCAR, I've experienced so many ups and downs, and it's just trying to control your, your downs. And, and trying to, to get back on top. Hopefully we could translate those things onto the cup side. A chance meeting with Dale Earnhardt Jr. put Barry's career on a different path. He kind of swooped me up and, and took me out of Middle Tennessee and just gave me an opportunity to drive for him a little bit. That's what meant so much to me about it because that was exactly what I needed. Eventually, he drove for Junior in the Xfinity Series, winning five times. Josevar is living the dream. He recently celebrated his 21st birthday. He's moving up to the Cup Series full time, driving the 77 car for Spire Motorsports. How will this rookie fit in with the veterans? You know, they're not going to take kindly if you school them or dirty them up by any means. You know, you, you, your benefit of the doubt is a rookie uh, and, and threshold. Their, their tolerance level right, is, is going to be a lot shorter if you're, you're a rookie. There's a line drawn between racing and mistakes uh, and, and then too far and, and, and you know, getting a cheap shot per se. So um, you know, excited to get going. Barry's replacing Kevin Harvick in the four car at the cup level but he knows his place. Kevin's legacy speaks for itself, right? Like, I'm not Kevin Harvick. I'm not trying to be Kevin Harvick. But, but the benefit to me is I'm stepping into a great opportunity that Kevin has built for, for years and years and years. And I think that, to me, that's a huge weight off my shoulders. Smith has a huge confidence advantage to start the season, having won at Daytona in the Truck Series the past two years. But the cup side is, is no joke. Everyone from, from first to last is there for a reason. They've, they've won races in this sport. They've won championships, and that's what makes it so tough. Whether he ends up with a Rookie of the Year or not, the driver of the 71 car hopes to stay racing on Sundays for a long time. Being with an established team and being a little older should work to Barry's advantage this year. But I think my experience will help. Um, even my, my starts that I had in the Cup Series last year, right, we, we had a, a fair amount of success given the circumstances, and I think that gives us a lot of momentum going into this year. Momentum they'll need. Advantages they'll take. And confidence they'll use trying to outrun not only one another, but every other driver in the Cup Series field.
Part of the intrigue or draw to the Daytona International Speedway is the fact that drivers are only a split second away from disaster. Over the years, this track has produced some of the most wild accidents in NASCAR history. You had the King Richard Petty in 1988, Rusty Wallace in 1993, Ryan Newman not once but twice in 2003, and then again in 2020. Accidents so spectacular, you never forget them. Ryan Priest had one of those accidents last season, but that hasn't stopped him. It takes certain personality traits to be a NASCAR driver, especially at a super speedway like Daytona. So super speedway racing is, is a game of chess. Um, I know some, you know, they obviously dread it. Uh, I, for one, am one who enjoys the challenge of it. Oh, and around goes a couple cars. Priest upside down. He's barrel rolling. That thought process grass. was put to the test last Ryan year for Priest. Ryan Priest, who was involved upside in the worst down. accident of his career in the summer race at Daytona. The car got airborne, barrel rolled multiple times, and violently flipped end over end before landing back on its wheels. But as a racer, you look at it as the... the Hey, this is this is part of it. Uh, you know, a lot of us have wrecked a lot in our life, and and we're going to continue to wreck. Like it's it's inevitable. So if you're afraid to wreck or, or have incidents like that, you should probably quit racing. During not only did Priest bruising, not quit nothing. racing, he didn't even miss a start. Have your eyes. He was back behind I the wheel of his 41 so car the next week at Darlington I mean, with two black eyes. You know, I come from a racing family. I would now I'll say. I mean. Both my wife and my father, it's probably done more damage to them than it did to me, seeing me, uh, you know, the way I looked for a little while. But um, for me, this is what I do. This is what I wake up and choose to do every single weekend. And to be honest with you, you could get hurt tomorrow doing absolutely something you don't even like. So why not do something you love every single day? The wreck was the low point of an extremely disappointing season that saw him finish 23rd in the points and miss out on the playoffs. You look at it. You look at the season and you can't hide from it. You know, none of us, each and every one of us wants to be better. As fate would have it, his first chance at doing better comes at Daytona and he can think of no better way to tame that beast than with a trip to victory lane. Well, Ryan Priest was not alone. It seemed like everybody at Stewart Haas Racing struggled last season. We already talked about Josh Berry taking over the four car for Kevin Harvick, but what about the 10? Who's going to be in the number 10 car? It is Noah Gregson replacing Eric Almarola. Gregson feels like he has so much to prove this season. Not a lot of guys get second chances at the cup level. So he's looking to make the most of it. Chase Briscoe is pretty much in the same boat. He failed to make the playoffs in 2023 after earning a spot back in 2022. The entire team looking for better results. It's a growing up moment. It's a maturity moment. And um, with the experiences over the last handful of months, um, I have to give a lot of credit to those around me who have helped me grow and, and learn as a person. I'm excited for this year, truthfully, just the clean slate that kind of comes with it, the being able to kind of hit the reset button um, and just start fresh and, and knowing that we're going to be way better than where we were last year. The Daytona 500 can be seen on Fox 8 this Sunday, just like it has every year since way back in 2001. This year, we will hear a new voice, though. Yeah, and that is a future Hall of Famer, Kevin Harvick. Kevin Harvick retired after last season, but he was quickly hired by Fox. Coming up next, we're going to hear from him on his big transition into the broadcast booth. And the sport of pickleball has taken the country by storm, especially in the last 18 months or so. Up next, how pickleball is even having a big impact on the NASCAR community.
Over the last few years, millions of Americans have jumped in on this pickleball craze. Yeah, a lot of NASCAR drivers have started playing as well. And, Kevin, it's not like going 190 miles an hour, but pickleball still gives these guys that competitive edge. A number of NASCAR drivers have come down with a case of pickleball fever, including Austin Dillon. If there's a tournament, a charity event, or even just someone wanting to practice, Austin is in. Uh, it's so competitive. I love ping pong growing up, and it kind of reminds me of a little, little bigger version of that. And I've really taken a liking to it, and um, it's just a lot of fun, and it keeps it high paced. Your hand-eye coordination really matters, and uh, you know it's a good retirement plan for me. I want to go pro <laughs> after I'm done racing. Austin was destined for racing because of his famous grandfather, Richard Childress, but he got into pickleball because of his dad. It's been a good bonding experience for the guys at RCR. We got three courts indoors upstairs, and our guys are playing at lunch. It's, it's one that's good for your heart. It's good, you know, endurance uh, cardio. And uh, some people say that, you know, that, you know, it's not that hard. I said, well, get out there and play with some good players, and you'll see, because uh, you'll be sweating. Pickleball is a big hit at colleague racing as well. Chris Rice is colleague's president and loves to get out there and mix it up as well. What it does for us as, as racers, it keeps our minds focused on things that we do each and every weekend, right? Um, because, and you can get your mind off of racing once you do pickleball, because now you're mad about the line and you're different, mad about different things. <laughs> green flag, green flag. Racing may be king down here at Daytona, but just five miles down the road from the speedway is a place called Pictona a huge facility with 49 pickleball courts. This is where the Dillons found their new passion. Uh, a lot of rules that you have to understand, but it's challenging because you got to really be under control. If you try and get too aggressive, it, it really doesn't go your way. You could say the same holds true in racing. There are more than 100 podcasts talking about NASCAR. One of the biggest ones, Dirty Mo Media, which is owned by Dale Earnhardt Jr. You know, Dirty Mo produces seven different podcasts during the season. And, Danny, the podcast has become a great way for fans to stay connected to their favorite drivers and the sport, and they remain thirsty for information. Honestly, believe we have some great personalities yeah, in the sport. That's and the chatter today, right? Is if that, they're really slow in qualifying, they probably don't even. Oh, if you believe this is the year, a race that we're going to watch. You always you know hear I mean? the term kind of like overused and ask, "Oh, the collaboration." collaboration. Dirty Mo Media has a specific purpose in the type of stories we tell, the type of uh, identity that we are. And I think it complements our industry. Mike Davis is the president and executive producer so at like, Dirty Mo Media. This was all open. There was no he has been a key figure in the growth of the NASCAR podcast sector. I think that it's, uh, it's just a type of media in which people can easily consume it. And it's also not too difficult to make, to be honest with you. Davis might be oversimplifying it just a touch. Tapping into Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s immense fan base was a key step. Remember, he was voted NASCAR's most popular driver 15 times in his career. I would love to have said that this was sort of all part of a master plan, but like, you know, Dale Jr. wasn't exactly an extrovert, you know, especially when he was dri uh, driving. I mean, like, he was insanely popular, lots of fans, but to be able to have conversation, especially long form conversation, that wasn't exactly how Dale Jr. was wired. Um, so there has been a bit of an evolution. I think that the podcast has sort of helped that. After the Dale Jr. download, there's door bumper clear. What's up, Freddie Kraft, spotted for Bubba Wallace this weekend. Which Good features some of the unsung face. heroes of NASCAR, the spotters, and the unique perspective they have on what's happening in the sport. Casey Boat is the host. They don't come to us for specific facts, right? Um, they come to us for opinions, things that you know, maybe they want to hear the inside scoop on what might be going on in the garage um, because fans don't get to see that every weekend. <laughs> yes. And sometimes that gets us in trouble. Denny Hamlin gives us our vantage point from the driver's seat. A relative new offering is Actions Detrimental with Denny Hamlin. It started last year and has become widely popular with listeners. It's very opinionated. Some might say to a fault. The, the old model just doesn't work. Doesn't mind sharing it. He was doing it on Twitter every week. Um, and he also happens to be business partners and owner with a man named Michael Jordan. Denny is polarizing. I think it fuels his motivation. All the folks at Dirty Mo are looking for what's next. I want to get these on television. I want to be able to have every pocket of consumption 
uh, the way that NASCAR fans consume. I want to have them covered. So maybe there's a master plan after all, and it's all coming together. Well, for over two decades, Fox has been the industry leader when it comes to covering NASCAR racing. This season, there will be a new voice. Kevin Harvick goes from the driver's seat to the broadcast booth, and he promises to bring a new energy as we get ready to start the new season. And putting races on television is a rather large production, and it happens every single week. Coming up next, we'll go inside the new NASCAR production facility in Charlotte. The goal is to attract new fans while keeping the existing ones entertained for years to come. Well, NASCAR is growing, and that's evident in just about every single aspect of the sport, including the production side of things. Just last month, a new 58,000 square foot building worth $53 million opened up. I took a tour of the new facility to see how it's going to help promote the latest and greatest that racing has to offer. Well, we want to grow the sport. The way to grow the sport is to take the racing to the fans. The fans viewing experience all starts here at the brand new NASCAR Productions facility. From archives to video editing to writing, this is where the magic happens. The hype videos you see on Twitter and all the social media, that's all come from this group right here. And of course, at every corner is a touch of the sports. The garage doors actually go up into the ceiling, so it gives you a feel like you're at a NASCAR garage, so the garage doors go up. The biggest benefit of the new building is the new technology starting with collecting data. And it goes on our website. We hand it off to the broadcaster. They're going to use it during the telecast. You're going to see that a lot. So that's the future, I think, is all the data that we now own. Even the broadcast equipment room is the only one in the world of its kind. So lots and lots of wire. I think we have probably 75 miles of wire up here that, that has been put in to run everything. It took months and months and months to get this straight. Every behind the scenes aspect is made to create quality on air productions. So when this control room is up and going, you'll have probably 25 people in this control room alone. This is almost like a NASCAR team in itself. You need every single piece to succeed. You need every single piece to succeed. It's like NASA 
command center, right? This is where everything comes together that we see at home when the broadcast looks so nice. The possibilities don't end at television production. So we built three studios in this building. It extends to both online content. This is our digital set. So on NASCAR.com, we'll put a lot of content out there or on social media. So this is where this is all originates from. And radio content as well. 38 races done back here goes out to the 750 radio stations across America when you're driving down the road and Sirius XM or your radio, you can hear the race as you're going down the road. A new building may not seem like a lot, but it's reflective of the growth of NASCAR and what it means to the community as a whole. We don't want to just be stuck as a, a, a southern known sport. We want to be global. Um, that's the way to grow this sport. We did build it for the whole industry. We're looking towards the future for sure um, as workflow changes and how production happens changes. We want to be on the cutting edge and be ready for the future. Ever since Daryl Waltrip left the NASCAR on Fox broadcast booth in 2017, Danny, they've used a rotation of talent to call the races. Yeah, now they have a new team, and they hope it sticks together for a long time. Mike Joy, Clint Boyer, Kevin Harvick. Sounds like a lot of... The NASCAR on Fox team has a new player this season. It's the recently retired driver, Kevin Harvick who has always been known as a guy who speaks his mind. And they all know me well enough to know that I'm going I'm to shoot it straight and, and tell it like I see it. And There's no hiding from that, right? I don't have to think about what I'm doing. And, you know, those guys, they, they, know, they know when they screw up and, and they know we have to call it like it is. The captain of the three-man team in the booth is Mike Joy, who will be calling his 45th Daytona 500. He's the glue that keeps it all together. <laughs> so far, it's a little like herding cats. You know, um, Kevin is laser focused. He's a fountain of information. And the best thing he brings us is that I've just been there and I've just done that. Clint brings the entertainment. He's got the attention span of a butterfly, but, but he is so passionate about this sport. I hope. I really hope it makes for interesting television, and I'm sure it will. It's actually more than just the three-person team. NASCAR on Fox also has talent along Pit Road and the pre-race hosts. Chris Myers, Jamie McMurray, Shannon Spake, to name a few, and the veteran Larry McReynolds, who sure loves talking about racing. This will be my 44th year to be a part of NASCAR for you know roughly 20 years as a crew member and a crew chief, and now going into my 24th year of NASCAR on Fox. And to be a guy from Birmingham, Alabama, that barely has a high school diploma, I feel like the most blessed guy walking the face of the earth. When it comes to broadcasting a NASCAR race, no one does it better than the Fox team. Informative, entertaining, they put on a great show. Well, those expectations for Harvick are pretty high, just like he was when he was a driver. But speaking of expectations, we'll be back with our picks for who will win the Daytona 500. That's coming up next.
Well, it's the time of the show where we're making our bold predictions for Sunday's race. I'm going to go first. The guys are having a little bit of technical difficulties. We see if we'll get to them. But for my pick, I actually made my pick long before the qualifying races. In fact, this is going to be my fourth year in a row picking Mr. Joey Logano. I don't want to hear that a poll winner hasn't won Daytona since the year 2000. But there's something more valuable than some of those useless stats. That's the loyalty of Clara Goodwin. He's going to get it done this year. Uh, finally. <laughs> All right, I'm going next. And Kevin, it was narrowed it down between Kyle Busch and Brad Keselowski. So I flipped a coin. Kyle Busch called heads. We're going to go with heads. Right, Kyle Busch. You could have made a case that he's the greatest driver ever, never to have won the Daytona 500. He's 0 for 18 in this race. He's been close uh, sometimes. Kyle Busch finally breaks through. Mark it down. Lock it in, Kyle All Busch. All right. I'm also going to go with a man who has never won the Great American Race. I'm going to go with Martin Truex Jr. He's been close before. He led some laps in his dual qualifying race, and the Toyota camp was very happy. Martin Truex wins his first ever Daytona 500, putting the icing on the cake of a great, great career. Hey, we hope you can join us again on Sunday morning at 12 noon. That is Countdown to Daytona Live. Again, we'll lead you right up to the start of the Daytona 500. Yeah, hope to see you then again tonight. Truck race going on tomorrow, Xfinity, and Sunday, the Daytona 500. Can't wait. Yeah, cross your fingers on the weather. Thanks yeah. for joining us, everybody. Have a great night, and we'll see you at the racetrack.